several weeks ago, many of you have known that our 13-year-old Tucker um, one day just mysteriously just said, Dad, I can't really move my legs. He was telling my wife and I that, and um, all of a sudden went from jumping on the trampoline to not being able to move. Um, and through the assistance of some really good medical friends, we were instructed to go to Children's and uh, very quickly found out that it was much more serious than we thought. And so we then proceeded a journey of spending two weeks in the hospital. Um, I literally thought we were coming home that night. I thought, we're going to go get like a shot or a Band-Aid. Probably is what I was thinking. It's probably a Band-Aid. Um, just our kids had never stayed in the hospital after they were born. And so just my assumption was they never would. Um, and so we spent two full weeks in the hospital. Um, the Lord has done miraculous things. And so through that time, Bob has asked me to share some reflections of what uh, Jen and I learned, um, particularly from our time. So just to kind of caveat this, though, um, I am not the know-it-all, end-all about suffering. Many of you in this room have suffered much more greatly than I have. Um, we've all suffered, and suffering is a part of our human condition. But I want to share with you some things we've learned that maybe be helpful. If you're not suffering now, I guess the promise is, if you're not suffering now, you will be. That's the life we're in until we see Jesus. And so, fully knowing that those seasons are going to be different for everybody, they're going to vary in length and intensity, um, we just hope that these things will be an encouragement and resonate with you and help you, because your season of suffering, I don't want to be like doom and gloom, but maybe you've already been there, but if you haven't, that's just the nature of it. Remember, it's just, it's not if you suffer, but when. I want to start just by, before we get into the scripture, I want to, read, I want to look at this quote by R.C. Sproul, late pastor and theologian. He said this, get that quote to go up there. Bingo. There it is. It's magic. Let's do that. Um, he said, this is a neat thing to think about. To suffer as a Christian carries no shame. In Peter's letter, Peter concludes that, therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good, as to a faithful creator, from 1 Peter 4.19. And here, Sproul says, Peter erases doubt about the question of whether it is ever the will of God that we should suffer. He speaks of those who suffer according to the will of God, and that text means that suffering itself is part of the sovereign will of God. So we know that, right? Suffering is real. It's not always because we did wrong things. And the Bible teaches a lot about it. One verse that really kind of was overarching for us through this season of suffering and difficulty was Proverbs 16.9. When I was in seminary, we served at a church in North Carolina, and our pastor there uh, taught me this, is that this is a way to live life. And I think this was reminded strongly for us that Proverbs 16.9 says, The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. See, the truth is we're supposed to make a plan, but we're supposed to make a plan loosely because we don't know what God wants to do. And so the, what he was always faithful to tell me was that the implication is we do make a plan. You don't just say, well, the Lord's coming back, so we don't worry about retirement. We make a plan, but we trust the Lord to establish our steps in these difficult seasons. So that's been an ever-present reminder for us that we're called to make a plan, but trust that God will do what he desires for his glory and our good. But in your life and my life, life is often full of surprises. Um, unexpected opportunities for growth. That's what my coaches used to call them. Opportunities for growth. It's like you got to get the weight room. They're like, That's, you're growing. But see, I, I, I know this. No one wants to suffer, and that's right. You shouldn't want to. But we often find ourselves in the midst of suffering anyway. But what we wanted to do as I was reflecting is to follow the pattern of sound words the Lord had set out for us. My favorite chapter, probably of the Bible, is in 2 Corinthians 4. And I just want to read um, verses 1 through 11. I'm going to give you some reflections of what we've experienced and try and reflect interactively on that text. Um, I think this is a powerful reminder of what God has done. So before we get into the text, let me pray for us and ask God's help. Um, Father, we need you. Um, 
We've confessed that. We've rejoiced in you already. But we need you to speak into our lives. We need it to go beyond my words and reflections and opinions. We need your spirit to ignite your word in our lives. To make it make sense to us. To make these spiritual realities come to life in our own lives. And we confess our need. We confess our inability. And pray that you, by the power of your spirit, and through your very word, would change us and change me. So we give this time to you and pray it in Jesus' good name. Amen. Amen. We're going to start at verse 1 of 2 Corinthians 4. If you've got a Bible, you can grab it or an app. Um, we're going to read those first 11 verses. I'll read it, and you can follow along. Verse 1 says, Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we have been given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. That whole chapter has always been powerful to me because it bookends with two key statements, is therefore don't lose heart. And in suffering, it's easy to lose heart. When things are hard, when difficulty comes, it is very easy to lose heart. And when we think about losing heart, it just means you've lost your courage to keep going. You just don't want to press on anymore because things are just too hard. And sometimes we walk in those seasons where we wonder where God is and what he's up to. Let me give you a few thoughts of what we've learned and, and reflect on this text with you. I'll give you ten, ten things. I think Bob called, may have called it accidentally a top ten list. Um, there's really nothing funny in the sermon, so it's you know, you're like, well, that was a, um, a top ten list. That was the worst one ever. Um, but let me give you those, these ten things that we've learned um, that I hope will be helpful to you. The first one is to live in the moment. Um, with all the uncertainty of lack of diagnosis, um, all of a sudden we have a son who potentially is never going to walk again. And that's what we found out the Saturday after we were there that broke us and made us wonder, okay, is our life about to radically change? I mean, that would be a radical change for us. To go from a kid who loves to play and play soccer and jump and do those things, like most normal kids, he just, this was going to be all the what-ifs began to circulate. And sometimes the full doctoring that they do doesn't always help because they tell you all the possibilities. You have to make sure they're covered, covered all the details. And sometimes there's certain things that you just wish they wouldn't say. Um, but in that, what we reminded each other, and it was each other because there were moments where I couldn't remember this, but I said, we have to deal with what's in front of us. This is what God has given us to live in right now. We don't know what next week will be. We don't even know what tomorrow, and that was a very clear. We went from jumping, playing kid to can't move kid in a day. So we were very aware that life could change in a moment. And we had to remind each other over and over that we had to deal with what we knew and what was right in front of us. We had to live in the moment. It's very easy to get way out ahead of yourself, 
especially when things aren't going well. Is this the end? Is this, right, postulating and wondering what's going to happen? And when we first got to Children's that Friday night, a little over a month ago, you know, we made our way through the ER. You can't, both parents can't go in. I'm sitting in the van for three hours just going, what's going on? And she's trying to figure out what's going on. We can't get into a room. We can't get a MRI. We're just waiting and waiting. And 12 hours later, we get into a room, and things were very unclear and uncertain. And these were the most painful moments because we had to consider what this might be for us. And it was in that moment, in that particular moment, that Saturday, that we, God was driving a stake in our heart to deal with what was in front of us, not what we couldn't control and couldn't live with. And this was a moment for us to remember that this daily ministry of God to us and everything we have is by his mercy. That was living in the moment for us. What verse 1 of 2 Corinthians 4 says, it's all his mercy. If, if, if anything you get to do is mercy. And so you can live with a moment by moment desperate dependence that God's mercy will meet you. We all need to remember his daily mercy so that we don't lose heart. It's remembering that these gifts of mercy keep us knowing they don't belong to us. These are gracious, merciful gifts in our lives that we get to do with our kids, with our friends, with our families. So that was the first thing that we learned. That was a big lesson for us to live in the moment. But the second thing was that friendship really mattered. Just deep, real friendship mattered. Because in the midst of struggle and heartache, it becomes clear who your real friends are. You just know. Um, and so many of you reached out to us, encouraged us, prayed for us, blessed us, and we knew that we had real friends. But we also knew we had real friends, surprisingly enough, all over the world. So when you've been in ministry for over 20 years and you've worked at several churches, you think you may have burned some bridges along the way. You kind of wonder about those churches you used to be at and wonder. <clears throat> and 100% of the churches I've ever served at, staff members, members, all reached out to us. And that was beautiful to us because we didn't know that. We didn't know they were our friends. We thought, well, they lived there. That was 20 years ago, right? Um, but you and them, all of you are the ones that pointed us back to Jesus. And that's what deep, good friends do. They point us to the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God shines the light and friends remind us of that. We were blessed by hundreds of people reaching out through social media, phone calls, texts, cards, letters. And let me just say that again. You guys are our family here in Little Rock. I mean, we have our family, but you're our family. And you all made that abundantly clear. There are also several folks who regularly reached out in deep and profound ways to see how they could pray and then actually prayed for us. Bob called me multiple times to check up on Tucker, to see how he was doing, to not just give you a report, but so he could know. And so many others did that. And it's very meaningful for us. My pastor friends from North Carolina, from Tennessee, from Kentucky that are longstanding friends. And there's also new ones that we've just met in the last six months. And but you mean the world to us. And we've learned this verse from Proverbs 17, 17. A true friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. That became very clear that friendship, deep friendship, really matters. That pastors are not lone islands. We need friends too. Thirdly, and this kind of dovetails in with that, is that the, the body of Christ really matters. Um, we really do need each other. We really do need relationships. We need people in our lives that speak into our lives. We need reminders of God's grace. 
And that's what the body is when it functions in its varied makeup, that it's got all these gifts, talents, abilities. When it's pouring together and functioning, it's fitting itself out in love. And in heartache and suffering, one of the things I had to learn because I'm kind of a put my head down and plow guy, I'm kind of a just going to kind of push through and deal with stuff. And there were several times where my wife, God really used her in my life just to remind me, let somebody else do that. That's a blessing for, that's the body of Christ being what it should be. And it is a huge lesson because I am, I'm just, I tend to be self-reliant and want to fix things and I'm not real handy, so that's kind of a limited ability to do. It's like, I can't fix anything at home, but I, but I like to try and, and make things work. But it was really important for us to see how important the body of Christ, and that's true about us as a local body that functioned deeply for us in this time, but how we saw the body of Christ is worldwide. That we've got friends in Asia, we've got friends in Europe, we've got friends all over this country, we've got friends in South America, and everybody. Just it, It's a commitment to pray for one another and to encourage one another as we go. That's, that was a huge lesson for us, is that the body of Christ really does matter. Fourth thing, uh, God is not against our emotions. That Saturday, um, after hearing the potential things that could be wrong with our child, um, that's probably the most intense emotional hours of our lives. To the point where Jen couldn't drive, um, couldn't even leave the hospital. Um, it, it just, and you can often feel that that's a guilt thing, that you shouldn't feel that way. Am I not trusting the Lord? But in fact, we know, we know that Jesus suffers with us, not suffering again the cross, but he hurts for us and knows deeply the suffering of his people. You think about him looking at Jerusalem and just weeping because he knew the brokenness and the suffering and the hurt and the heartache, and that's how he still feels about us. The only place you really know what Jesus' heart is like is when he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. And he says this about his heart. He's gentle and lowly in heart. He hurts for his people. And he hurt for us, and we knew that. He's not against our emotions. And there were moments of that, of deep emotion, of a kind of uncontrollable suffering and sorrow. But we learned, not only is he not against him, those emotions aren't too big for God. Sometimes I think I've been tempted to think, kind of keep it in line, keep it in check. I think it was in those really dark moments of seeing and trusting him and suffering what it really looks like, that it's not clean, it's not perfect, it's full of ups and downs, messy days. It's a lot of days where Jen would have to encourage me, and then 30 minutes later, I'd have to encourage her. This sort of push-me-pull-you kind of thing that we would do to kind of help each other, or that maybe God used some of you to help us to remember things because of the, the weight of it and the, the wide range of emotions that are congruent to the s differing situations we find ourselves in. It's normal to be really sad when bad things happen. It's, it's good to be righteously angry when people sin. God is those things. So he's not against our emotions. And through these ups and downs and messiness, we... All we grew in our abiding trust in Jesus and his goodness. I don't think that in any way that we are told to not be scared or angry. We're, we're called to trust and not despair. But there's a different way to do it, a different way to feel. I mean, in fact, the whole book of Lamentations is clear evidence that there is a way to have deep emotion and yet not sin. We, so, I think we learn this, and I think we can all learn. We can be upset and ask God, like Job, right? We, we can ask God 
But what Lamentations talks about, we have to call to mind the steadfast love of the Lord that never ceases. And how great his faithfulness and his new mercies are that come with each new day. That we had to do some of those things and remind ourselves of truth in the midst of up and down emotions. And some of that changing and dealing with processing emotion differently comes through failing. Failing to trust Jesus or doubt his goodness. And in that, he would lead us to repentance and deeper faith, stronger hope in him. Because what it really did in those deep emotional times, it took our hope really out of this life. Because it just made him clear this life isn't going to provide any hope for us. Which is not. Our only hope was Jesus. And so we did have moments of getting angry with each other. More than we'd like to admit, but that was certainly there with doctors, with what they were saying, with the fourth and subsequent MRIs that they have to redo a port on our kid's arm when we're about to go home. Uh, with our diagnosis, all these things were just intense, and, but we were also hurt, and we had to slow down and think through lots. But it was important for us to bring our feelings out in the open, confess and repent the wrong things, own what we did wrong, what we thought wrong, and weep and hug each other as we laid them all at the foot of the cross, just trusting Jesus. God's not against our emotions, and so when you walk through a season of difficulty and suffering, God does not want you to pretend that you're okay. You know, that's a classic. We go to church. How are you? Fine. Speaking of Richard, Richard and I have had lengthy discussions about, you never say that. He's like, he's always like, don't ever say that. It's not true. Um, but there's a pretense we can have in suffering to act like we're okay, and that's not what we should do. We should own it and be honest because God is not against those. Fifthly, uh, we begin to see God's timing and everything. Um, we got five coming up there. There he goes. So, we begin to see God's timing and just having to walk and depend on the Holy Spirit. Um, just seeing how he was doing stuff. And so many of you brought food. Um, there were so many people praying. Um, just slow down and remember every day that God is always on time and that his spirit is doing a work in us that we can't do for ourselves. There was a, a part of this that we had to learn to walk what Romans talks about, the not by our flesh but according to his spirit, to depend on God. And Jen had several times where she just knew that the Holy Spirit was interceding for her giving her words to say when she couldn't sort out what to pray. But also, and this was a, a sweet and hard moment for her, leading her to say, this isn't what I want. I don't want this for our kid. I don't want this for our family. But if this is glorifying to you, I'll receive it. That's not a natural response. Not because she's not awesome, but that's not anybody's natural response. And so we begin to lean into what God would have for us, depending on him in prayer, um, wanting what he wants, no matter what that looks like in our lives. And just like how the verse 7 starts in 2 Corinthians 4, we truly felt like weak vessels, like jars of clay. But this reminded us that it was by God's power and not our own that anything good would come from the suffering. But I'll tell you this, in the timing and dependence, what we began to see is just, we went in on Friday night. He did an MRI in the middle of the night. We got in a room, bad diagnosis, don't know what's going on on Saturday, can't move. Um, they ordered two more MRIs a contrast and a brain scan Saturday night. So we do that, and about 1.30, the doctor comes in and tells us the results, which is the best time to tell you results of any major test is about 1.30 in the morning. Um, and they say, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know what's going on. So we're going to start something. We're going to start IV steroids, and we're going to get going with that. And 
so that's at 1.30 that night, and it started about 2. So the nurse that night had come in, and she would kind of had to hook him up and get the machine set up and do all this, and she literally had just set it up and just started it, and she did a reflex check on him, and his foot that hadn't moved in over 12 hours flinched. And that's, she looked over, and I'm awake because they've told me all this news, so I'm watching, and she goes, did you see that? I said, I saw that. And she said, that hasn't happened. So then the doctors just began to be amazed because doctor after doctor said steroids don't work that fast. Even the next day, they're like, even six, eight hours later, steroids don't work that fast. By the next morning, he's wiggling his toes. He can move his knees. He's starting to have movement and feeling in his leg. Well, that's just what, we were weak, but God was strong and strong through his people and through your prayers. And it was a pretty amazing moment just to go, okay, this is, we believe in medicine. We need medicine and it's helpful and good, but God is greater and he does more. The next thing that we were really reminded of that is we just don't want to rely on ourselves and trust the power of God in our lives, but that God is always working. He's working in all things. He's always working. To remind our kids that, that and remind ourselves that God is always at work. He is never weary. He's not wearied by our constant asking him for help. He's not weary because of having to help us so many times. He never runs out of resources or power or anything. He's always working. And we saw that. See, this was more than just Tucker's body. I was working in his heart. And, and through this and many other people's lives, encouraging more communication, love, care for one another. And so we could begin to see and remind ourselves, this is God's doing. He's doing this. He's at work and pointing us back to what he was doing. And what we heard from so many people whether it's through Caring Bridge or through Facebook, different ways with it, God was truly working in their lives, which was an unexpected, unintended consequence. All we want to do is get through this thing. And what we began to see was God had greater intentions with this, that he wanted to do a work in our family and in our son and in our lives, but also maybe to do more than that, to reach into other people's lives that through praying for us brought a greater love and gratefulness in their hearts. And so we're continuing to remind each other to look for God's work and join him in it. I mean, it's God who shines the light in our hearts, right? It's he who reveals the glory of Christ to us, but yet we can be an encouragement and pointers to that to keep reminding each other that God's always working, even when you struggle. Now, that's not easy. I don't mean that in a platitude like, We've talked about when we were going through Romans, we don't just give Romans 8.28 when people are in the midst of heartache. But gently, we have to remind you that the Lord is working. And he doesn't grow weary. And what was important for us on that, we need to remind each other of that. Next, this was the, the kind of the flip side to focus on the moment, live in the moment, is to always focus on Eternal things. Always fight for an eternal focus. Part of the reason I love chapter 4 in 2 Corinthians is not only does it start with this not losing hope, not losing heart because we have this ministry by the mercy of God, it ends there. And it says that we're to fix our eyes on unseen things, eternal things. If you think about how that talks about it, just maybe it's good for us just to Pull it up and just read those last few verses. It's not on your slide, but verse 16 says, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient or temporal, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And that's what we had to fight for because not only are you going to live in the moment, but you can get overwhelmed with suffering. 
You can get overwhelmed with circumstances and challenges and difficulty. And we have to focus and set our minds on things above, right? We have to actively do that. It doesn't magically happen. And sometimes God uses suffering to draw us back to that. We, want, we begin to lose heart. And he says, I know you're wasting away outwardly, but inwardly I'm going to keep renewing you day by day. So don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Focus on eternal things. Focus on the kingdom and what really matters. And that wasn't easy either. It wasn't natural for us. We wanted to fix this situation and we wanted to get our family back together. We wanted our, you know, we, my wife and I wanted to be at home at the same time. Um, you know, just normal kind of things we wanted. We had to be reminding ourselves Yes, we live in the moment. Yes, we deal with what's in front of us. But let's keep our eyes focused on the things that really matter. Eternity, the kingdom, God's goodness and grace, what he wants. And that's the balance that helps us living in the moment, but with an eternal focus. And we have to strive daily to keep our eyes on Jesus. What the Bible calls, he's the author and perfecter of our faith, right? And so it says that we look to him. Because he's the one at work. So we have to set our minds, our eyes, our focus on Jesus. And one of the ways we do that is just re we remind ourselves of the gospel every day. We don't get tired of it. We don't grow weary of it. And the steadfast love of the Lord that never ceases. That he loves his people not because they're good people, but because he is good. Last couple that I want to give you here. I've got three more. Um... We learned about God's provision. And there's some obvious ways that people gave us money. Um, many of you did, and that was very sweet and timely. Because we didn't know what the heck we were going to do. And thankfully, we have really good insurance. So, but this could have been devastating to us. It just could have been. And it wasn't. And, but there were other ways. Not just financial resources, but we started to see that where we live... Well, every time we talk to the nurses and doctors, like, so people come from all over the state and out of the state to go there. We live nine minutes away from the hospital, which made our dealing with things much easier. How's God's provision? When we first moved here, we could not find a house. And over and over again, God's reminded us this was the house he wanted. And it's not a new house. Let me remind you. I'll show you pictures if you've not been there. The house is like 60 years old, and you might go, that's a great house. We have the original Appliances. Um, so, but it is the house God wanted for us. And there's several reasons. One is where we live close to children. So we really, we hop on the highway and we're there. But also, this growing relationship we have with our neighbors. Like through this, our, we become better friends with our neighbors because they wanted to know how Tucker was doing. They wanted to know if they could help. And listen, many of them are not believers. Many of our neighbors aren't, but they're friends. And we hope that one day God will do work in their lives. Jen particularly had a sweet family uh, that we know walked down and prayed for her one day. Just walked down and stopped and prayed for her. And it was one of the sweetest things because we thought they were Christians, but we didn't know. And... It was also in the midst of a lot of racial things, and the fact that we weren't of the same race made this incredibly sweet moment. And it just reminded us of why, we, why we're in that neighborhood, is to build those relationships with those people, and how God provided relationships. He didn't just, we didn't build them, he provided them. Through this suffering, he deepened it. So there's... Where we live is a big part of that, and the way we do things, the friends for our kids and our family, but also just the staff and the docs that we know, just knowing John Dietrich and Rick Houck, knowing those guys to be encouragements to us. They understand what's going on. But then for Kip Weaver to be the chief resident. I mean, you don't know Kip, but he, they're people from here. And for him to check on us and come by, brought me coffee one day. I'd already had a lot of coffee that day, but it was very nice. But just to come and listen and talk through in very non-esoteric ways, just this is 
hey, here's what's, you know, it's going to be all right. Here's what we're thinking and kind of help navigate some of that. If you know Hannah Jernigan, she was on, she was on when we first got there. It's just, and she came by the room and just encouraged, said, hey, do y'all need to come to our house? They live four minutes away. Just, I was like, no, but that, just the sweetness of that. God provided over and over again people that just stopped by in our rooms or came by our house to check on us and bring us coffee, food, or just to talk, or just to sit and be quiet. God was incredibly good in providing so many ways. Conversations, gift cards, finances, but people and relationships were huge for us and are still. So I hope you learn that too. You do in suffering God does not leave you to your own resources. He just doesn't. He does provide. If he's willing to shine the light of the glory of God in people's hearts, if he's willing to give his son, won't he freely together with him give us all things we need? He'll take care of us. We can trust that. God provides. Last two. Number nine, this Jen just found this very uh, incredible way of just seeing how intricately creative God is. To create orchestrating conversations as she's just out walking and runs into neighbors that go to Geyer Springs that then share this on their prayer list and then they just this sort of the way God was weaving together people. She was just walking and just felt this nudge kind of to talk to the neighbors and what was going on. And, and it just, it led to hundreds more people praying for our family. You know, we could have never signed up or rallied as many as God did through his unique way of working in all things. He's intricately creative in how he puts people in your lives that encourage speak into your life or that you can speak into theirs. And we saw that and felt that in the midst of this, that God didn't take the normal means sometimes. He sometimes went the back door or the side door to bring some encouragement or some challenge into our lives at just the right time in a perfect way. I mean, so many times of just perfect timing perfect way of meeting us because he's intricately creative that's why we can look at creation and wonder at the glory of God because he's intricately creative and he deals the way he makes things he deals with his people that way so we can rejoice in that and know he will meet us in creative ways in our suffering the last thing that we learned and it was this is underneath it all and over it all um, the biggest absolute truth is that God is sovereign. That he is sovereign in all things. He's sovereign in the sickness of my son. He's sovereign if he never gives it back, the walking ability. He is sovereign if he heals completely. In all ways, we had to come to a deep, deep abiding truth that God is in control. That our lives are a pretense of control. We get in our cars, we get on airplanes, we do all these things with a pretense of control. And we have very little. And in suffering, God removes some of those things and lets you go, who's really the king? Over everything but in your life, who's the king? Is it your circumstances, your bank account? Is it... Uh, the number of likes you get on social media posts? Is it the downtime? What, what's king? And ultimately, it had to be that he was, and he is. Because when you're in the pit, you don't need a buddy. You need a king. You need to know that the one that made the pit can get you out of that pit. But even if he doesn't, he's still your king. Not an easy truth, but we have to, had to remind ourselves, he is our king, and we serve him. And it's whatever he decides, 
is right. Our God is good and he does good. And whatever he does, big and small. We saw that. We saw it in conversations and all these little bitty finger ways of just how God was sovereignly working out good things in our lives. But that's also the big overarching statement of it. The timing, God's work, God's care, God's people, friendships, all that is from his sovereign good hand. That we don't produce that. He does. So that he gets the glory for it. So I don't stand here and say, look what I've done. I can stand here and say, look what the Lord has done. For he is good and his mercy endures forever. So we had times of struggle with that. We weird tests, suffering of pain and heartache and sleepless nights and weird hospital dreams. Gosh, they can be the weirdest. Um, but all those things just to remember God's sovereign. And so when you suffer, because you will, it won't be easy. It just never will be. But God will make it profitable. He will make it worth it for his glory. He'll display his glory. And he will promote his glory. And that will be your good. And as we think about what our real hope and suffering is, we have to remember Jesus. <clears throat> Again, R.C. Sproul says it this way. I put this quote up by him. He says, we're going to get there. Get the quote for me. Ah, huh. here it is. Very good. I keep looking back here and all I see is my face. It's not helpful. R.C. Sproul says it this way. What is difficult to bear without Christ is made far more bearable with Christ. What is a heavy burden to carry alone becomes a far lighter burden to carry with his help. It's precisely the presence and help of Christ in times of suffering that makes it possible for us to stand up under pressure. To suffer without Christ is to risk being totally and completely crushed. And I've often wondered how people cope with the trials of life without the strength found in him. When I was in seminary, I worked with a girl um, who was not a believer, had lots of sin struggles in her life, but over a year's time, I've developed somewhat of a friendship with her. I was a good worker. She respected that. We differed on everything, everything. But I remember a unique conversation that reflects on what Sproul was saying, that she had a brother who was, at the time, 16 or 17 with muscular dystrophy, and he decided he didn't want the feeding tube anymore. So he's just going to starve himself to death. And she was in her early 20s. And she was, I could tell she was upset. So this kind of brought this conversation about it. And I said, how do you deal with that? She said, I don't know. I drink a lot. I was like, how's that working? She's not, not real great. Without Christ, we don't have what we need to suffer. If we don't know he's with us in our suffering, we will be crushed. And that's what 2 Corinthians 4 reminds us of. So we think about the gospel for suffering. How do we learn from it? Think about those phrases that it talks about um, in the first part of it, right? That we're afflicted in every way. Right? We're going to have suffering, but we're not crushed. Why? Because Jesus was crushed for our iniquities. That's why we're not crushed. It says we're perplexed by life and suffering, but we're not driven to despair because Jesus wept blood over the desperate situation that he was about to endure. And we may be persecuted, but we're not forsaken because Jesus was forsaken by God on the cross. So we will know that in our deepest suffering, we never will be. We may even be struck down, what it says, by disease, injury, or old age. But it says we're not destroyed by it because Jesus gave his life so that no matter what we suffer in this life, it will not be our end. He has defeated death and hell so that we can have real hope in suffering. 
I hope that whether you're listening online or you're here, that you know Jesus in that way. As your substitute and sacrificial Lord and friend, the one that sticks closer than a brother, that gives his life gladly, that seeks after the lost sheep, that comes after his people. But if Jesus is not your treasure and you don't know him in this way, I'd love to show you how you can. I, whether it's talking to me or any of the other elders or just somebody you know loves Christ, to talk to them about how can you surrender your life to Jesus and know him in a deep, real way, to know that your sins are forgiven, to know you have peace with God through the blood of Jesus Christ, that you don't have to make yourself right with God, that God has done all that's required. But if you're online or anybody, you can go to our website you can send us an email. Um, I get most of those emails. You can send them to us. And if you want to connect, you want to know more about Jesus, um, if you have questions about that, we'd love to talk with you about that. But all of us forget Jesus' sacrifice. And that's why Jesus gave us the Lord's Supper, because he knew we would be prone to forget. And we wouldn't do all we do to remember him. So as we transition into taking communion together, just if you know him and love him, you're welcome to take this with us. Hopefully you got your little combo cup from the back. But if you don't, if that's not you, the Bible says to take this meal without reflection of your own soul and in an unworthy manner is to bring judgment on yourself. So we'd ask you not to do that. But if you know and love Christ, we encourage you to participate in it. If you're at home and you're doing this as well, that applies there as well. If you know and love Christ, we'd love for you to join us. So let's just take a moment. Um, I know we've kind of not done this as much, but let's just take a moment and consider... Um, what it means to take this cup and this bread in an unworthy manner. I will say this for the Christian, the only way to take it in an unworthy manner is to think that it's by your worthiness that you're taking it. But just to take a moment and reflect, if there's things you need to confess, we've already had a time of confession, but just things that you need to talk with Jesus about before we take these, let's just spend a moment and do that and reflect and then we'll take these here in just a second. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, broke it, and gave his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. And Father, we know that we forget the greatness of your sacrifice, the perfections of Christ to die in our place, to give us hope for all eternity. Help us to remember Jesus today and every day so that you would be glorified in and through us. We pray in Jesus' good name. Amen. After they finished the meal, he took a cup. So this is the cup of salvation. The new covenant will be in my blood. And I will give forgiveness for sins for those who put their trust in my blood. So Father, we thank you for the blood of Christ. That though we're, our sins were like scarlet, you've made them white as snow. And what we sing, we stand forgiven at the cross. How amazing is that grace. 
Thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're gonna stand and sing um, the end of the power of the cross, and then I will close us with a benediction. So let's stand and do that. receive this benediction from the end of second